So uh, this week in the Gospel of Mark, as many of you know, we've been looking through the Gospel of Mark, and this week, again, we look at Passion Week, the, the week that Jesus was crucified, uh, the week that everything kind of fell apart, and he experienced uh, death. So um, in our verses today, we find Jesus pouring out his heart to God to help him in this terrible moment before his trumped-up trial, before his crucifixion and death. So if Mark's main question is this, who is Jesus? Then what is his message here in these final chapters? And what we find here is that Mark leads us up to Jesus' death, and he helps us understand the meaning of his death, which is salvation with God, which is God redeems us and embraces us through the death of Jesus. So here in chapter 14, we find Jesus actually preparing himself spiritually for this moment, for this moment of salvation, which pretty clearly demonstrates that Jesus, even in his humanity, is strong and we're weak. Uh, It's no more better laid out than maybe here in Mark 14 at the Uh, Garden of Gethsemane. And that may sound like bad news that we're weak, but it's actually good news because Jesus is strong, because Jesus alone can bring us salvation. But it's kind of an interesting way in which we find out that Jesus can bear our salvation alone. Here in Mark 14, we find Jesus very un-Jesus-like, We find him emotionally needy. I mean, he's like really needy. But then, you know, he's about to bear the sin of the world on his shoulders. He's going to die a horrific death on Roman crucifixion. We know that God the Father is going to turn away from him because of our sins. We know he's going to die alone. I guess it's understandable that in this moment, Jesus might be emotionally needy. So he appeals here to his closest friends, His chief disciples, not just, you know, anybody, he appeals to the top three, Peter, James, and John, and he asks them to stay with him. He asks them to partner with him in prayer. He needs their closeness. He needs them here where they can be with him and identify with him and empathize with him and be a help to him. So I want you to think about that for a moment. Has there ever been a time when you were like really emotionally needy? And um, you go to like one of your best friends and you start to pour out your soul and all of a sudden they like turn the conversation around and it becomes about them and they hijack your conversation. Or you go to your, you know, try to go to your best friend and they just sort of like disappear. You can't find them or you can't get a hold of them or they can't meet with you or whatever and you're just sort of left alone. All of us have experienced that to some degree. But I think if you put yourself in that position for a moment and ride with me through this passage, you'll see what Jesus experienced. And I think you'll begin to understand the depth to which Jesus went for us. Okay? So let's take a look at that um, verses 27 through 31. It says, and Jesus said to them, you will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. So we see here our first point, Jesus' prophecy and Peter's promise. So have you ever thought at some point in your life or recently, you know, Jesus doesn't really know me very well, and I'm not sure he really loves me. If you've thought that, I I want you to watch Jesus through this sequence of events. Because you can see that Jesus actually understands human nature all too well. He understands us better than we even know ourselves. He can look into the eyes of his best disciples and know for certain 
that as he looks into their eyes, that as soon as the trouble hits, they're going to scatter. He knows it. Jesus knows his friends intimately, and he knows us. Verse 27 speaks through the prophet voice. Jesus actually quotes Zechariah 13, 7, when he, he says, the shepherd will be struck and the sheep will be scattered. And this is actually a passage of judgment against God's people. It's a prophetic passage of judgment. Uh, Zechariah is looking forward to that day in which there's going to be an invasion by the larger, stronger country, Babylon, an invasion that had been predicted for years before because God's people had abandoned God. And so Zechariah is saying to them, look, it's all going to fall apart. The, the king is going to be struck down. The shepherd and the sheep are going to be scattered. Actually, two-thirds of the population of Judah was destroyed in that invasion. It was awful. I mean, war is hell. An invasion by a large, more powerful, hostile state is devastating to all. I mean, you don't have to look very long at the footage, the raw footage from Ukraine to get that in our heads. We see indiscriminate slaughter, the intentional psychological warfare against young and old alike, and Jesus is reminding his disciples of a horrific time in their history. That when their sins found, their, found them out, when they experienced the consequences of abandoning their God, utter devastation. And Jesus is predicting that in a few short hours, chaos will ensue as he is captured and crucified and they will be scattered like sheep, just like the Babylonian invasion. Peter, of course, here puts on the face of bravado and speaks for the disciples, we will not run, we will stand with you, okay? And unlike the Ukrainians uh, who did do that, uh, Peter ran. So now I want you to count for a minute. How many times did Peter fail Jesus right here in this passage? I know Jesus counts three, and I don't want to dispute Jesus' count of three times that Peter denied him. Uh, Jesus is talking about those literal times that he's talking about a specific thing, but just, just look through the passage here. How many times did Jesus, actually, or Peter, deny Jesus? And that Jesus actually knew that this was going to happen and predicted it. Um, you know, sometimes you look in the face of a friend and you ask them for a favor and you walk away going, they're not going to do that. They're just not going to do that. Or you can kind of read somebody's posture or their face. I remember uh, I react poorly to general anesthesia, and I'm, you know, in general, a, a large person, and so they tend to over-anesthetize me, and so then I feel, like, really sick, and so I had to go in for surgery, and I'm looking at the anesthetist uh, assistant, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not judging too much, um, <clears throat> but, you know, he had his, like, shirt open, and chest hair coming out, and he had gold chains. I'm thinking, this guy's in a midlife crisis. He's only thinking about himself. And so I have this conversation with him, dude, you know, hey, tried to speak his language. Dude, dude, listen, I get really sick. Can you, like, not put so much stuff in me? And I could tell because he's looking past me as he's saying, sure, no problem. Sure, no problem. I'm thinking, this guy never heard me and I'm going to get juiced big time. And I did. Okay, so that's what's happening here. Peter, Jesus is looking in Peter's eyes. He's trying to, like, get to Peter, and he's saying, nope, he isn't getting a single thing I'm saying. Okay, listen, let's count here for a minute. You know, <clears throat> um, First of all, Peter denies Jesus twice. Right here, Jesus tells him, you're going to abandon me. And Peter says, nope. I mean, here is the eternal Son of God, the creator of the, and sustainer of the universe, telling him what he's going to do. And Peter says, nope. 
I know that you created everybody else and you did everything else amazingly, but that's not going to happen to me. I'm going to go against all powers and all um, predictions, and I'm going to actually come through. Okay, in the next little bit, when he goes with Jesus to pray, Jesus asks him to pray with him. Oh, yes, Jesus will come and pray with you, and they fall asleep. So that's two more times, and then the three times before the trial. Okay, so how many times did Peter deny Jesus? A lot, right? Jesus can see the weakness written into their faces. He can hear the false courage crackling in their voices. Something you need to know about Jesus is Jesus knows your weakness. Jesus knows your weakness. You don't fool him about that. You can't cover it up. Just because you have a suit and a tie like I do on Sunday morning doesn't mean that it's all covered up. He knows exactly who you are. He looks into your eyes and he knows. He knows your weakness. David in Psalm 103, he anticipates this. He says in Psalm 103, verse 14, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. The writer to the Hebrews reflecting on humanity says the same thing. Verse, chapter 4, verse 13. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, yet we have one who has been res- uh, in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus knows. He knows you better than you know yourself. He can look you in the eyes and call you out. Not shame you, but invite you to be honest about who you are and your weaknesses. So why does Jesus quote this horrific prophetic passage like Zechariah 13? And that's the good news. Because Jesus knows in this particular situation, history will not repeat itself. In the case of the Old Testament, the people abandoned God, and then God temporarily abandoned them. But in this case, God will abandon Jesus and will stay with the people who abandoned him. History does not repeat itself. The Apostle John, who was perhaps the most intimate with Jesus, who experienced, like Peter, his own terrible weakness, said this about Jesus at this very time, John 13, 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Jesus did not abandon his disciples or his people, even though they abandoned him. John knows, probably better than anyone, my guess is that every single minute of that last week of Jesus' passion, the trauma of it etched it into his brain. Those words, those scenes, are just burned into his brain by the trauma of it all. <clears throat> so Jesus knows your weakness. If you think you are strong, you probably have just, like Peter, covered up your weakness with bravado. I like what Steve Brown has to say about young men who think they will never fail. He says to them, Son, you have not lived long enough nor sinned deep enough to even have an opinion about that. So embrace the truth. Know that you are weak. Know that there are times that you will fail. Because Jesus knows. Jesus actually doesn't just know, but he has prepared for your your failure. Jesus was abandoned in his greatest moment of weakness so that he could prove to you that he will never, ever abandon you. So Jesus also has prepared for our weakness. He laid out a plan so his disciples included their failure and their weakness would end in their salvation and their spiritual growth. When I was young and had no sense, 
not that long ago. <clears throat> Early in, in our marriage, in our mid-20s, uh, I thought I was strong and courageous and wonderful and loving and couldn't believe that anybody would think differently. I really was just foolish and selfish, honestly. And I made a lot of mistakes, a lot of mistakes. About 10 years later, in our mid-30s, Suzanne and I were talking about some of those events and things that happened early, and she began to tell me about a time that shocked me because she was telling me when God protected me and I didn't even know it. I wasn't even aware. I wasn't even aware that God had moved in a certain way to protect me, to protect us. And I was shocked and humbled at, about how arrogant and selfish I had been. But I was also encouraged because Jesus not only knew my weaknesses, but he prepared for them in advance. And he laid out a pathway to save me. So pay attention. Pay attention. When Jesus exposes your weakness, that's not a bad thing. That's a really good thing because he's also preparing to save you and has done so. Which gets us to our, our next point. Jesus' prayer and the disciples' frailty. Look at starting in verse 32. <clears throat> it says, And they went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I, while I pray. And he took with him Peter, James, and John, and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little further, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible for you, that the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and he found them sleeping and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So I want you to notice he takes his three closest companions, Peter, James, and John. These are men who are not just his disciples, but they're the inner circle of his disciples. The three with whom he has a very, very close relationship. He has a hope that these men will tune in to his neediness and help him through this hour. In verse 34, he describes himself as being very sorrowful even to death. So the word very sorrowful in the Greek is perilupas. So you're probably uh, familiar with uh, the word paraclete or parakletos, which means to be surrounded by comfort. The comforter has come, the parakletos. Okay, so this is the opposite of that. This is the perilupos. He is surrounded by sorrow. He can't go in any direction and not find sorrow. Everything is around him. Uh, it's, it reminds you of the words of Psalm 22:12, which is that messianic psalm predicting Jesus' death. And it says, Many bulls encompass me, many strong bulls of Bashan surround me. So the bulls of Bashan were considered the biggest and the strongest. Uh, they pastured on what now is called the Golan Heights, a very lush, hilly region at the end of the Jezreel Valley. And so they were these big, powerful animals. And so David is imagining himself being surrounded by these bulls. There's no escape. He is going to be crushed to death. And that's how Jesus feels. Mark describes him as praying prostrate upon the ground. Okay, so that means he falls upon the ground on his face and he pours out his soul in agony to his father. So my grandfather, who was an atheist, had a striking conversion in that he felt the presence of Jesus at a particular time in his life in such a powerful way that he fell on his face in the barn. His very first prayer ever <laughs> was crying out to Jesus saying, be merciful to me a sinner. He gave his soul to Jesus. That describes, that position describes the intensity of Jesus' experience. In verse 36, Jesus uses the most intimate familial word to describe his relationship to God the Father. He cry, cries out, Abba, Abba. What a Jewish child calls his father. It's like daddy or papa. 
Even the Jews understood that they had a special relationship with God, that they were intimate with God in a way, but they would never use that term, ever, because that felt disrespectful to them. And then again in verse 36, Jesus prays for the cup to pass from him. So what does he mean? If he, if he, does he mean he, he doesn't want to go to the cross? And if he does mean that, how would Jesus pray a prayer to God that would not be answered? Or how, what's happening here? Well, first of all, Mark refers to the cup. What is the cup? He refers to it in chapter 1038, where his disciples say, yeah, yeah, Jesus, we can drink the cup that you are going to drink of. So the cup is a reference to the Old Testament of God's anger and judgment against sinfulness. Psalm 75, that the cup of God's anger and wrath is foaming and it's poured out upon the people. And if Jesus prays for this cup, this cup of God's judgment, to be, pa- or to be taken from him, would not his prayer be answered? He's Jesus, the eternal Son of God. I like how D.A. Carson answers this question, and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit and then quote him. He says that the anxiety of facing suffering and death, the cup of God's wrath to the full, is so overwhelming and terrifying that in the moment Jesus desires that it would just go away. So much so that he describes himself as sorrowful to death. And this creates a deep desire within him to find another way to get out of this, if that's at all possible. But, as Jesus reflects, and this is what D.A. Carson says, there is a deeper desire still within Jesus' soul. And that deeper desire is to carry out the Father's will. He's willing to face his most great and tangible fear for the sake of, of carrying out the Father's will. The writer to the Hebrews, who is himself in the midst of horrendous suffering, describes Jesus' greatest desire of completing the Father's will as joy. That as Jesus digs down to the very bottom of what's motivating him, he finds joy. He finds joy. For the joy set before him endured the cross and despised its shame. That although there's a tremendous amount of fear present in Jesus, what triumphs for him is the greatest, most deep desire within him, which is the joy to do the Father's will. You know, I sometimes think we don't plumb our hearts deep enough. I think we stay often in the upper levels of fear and anxiety. And we just don't dig down. We just don't think what lays at the bottom. And sometimes we have to ask ourselves the question, what is our deepest desire? What is the deepest desire that lays within us? What really is motivating us? And that's what Jesus is asking us to do. I like the motto of the Journey Discipleship course, which says, think big, start small, go deep. A lot of us need to start digging deeper as Christians. We spend a lot of time in the surface of fear and anxiety when we could actually walk through them into the deepest joy that lays at the bottom. Because there's something there. God has placed it there for us. So look again at what happens here. Uh, Again, we don't see Jesus emotionally needy like this very often. As a matter of fact, I don't think we ever see him that needy in the Gospels except for in this exact place. But we we see him here completely at the end of his human rope. Uh, Walter Wessel in his commentary on Mark says it this way, and I think he says it appropriately. Jesus did not die serenely as as both a Christian and Jewish martyrs have. Now we have these pictures of Christians and Jewish martyrs, you know, welcoming death, smiling in the face of death. That isn't what happens here with Jesus. He was no mere martyr. He is the Lamb of God, bearing the penalty of the sins of all mankind. The wrath of God was turned loose on him. And only this can adequately explain what happened uh, 
in Gethsemane. All right, so here's the turn. So even though we see clearly that Jesus is extremely distraught, he's in need of at least some small drop of emotional support from his disciples. Do they give him anything? No. Jesus bears the entire burden of the emotional anticipation and stress of the cross by himself. It's a bad place to be. Many of us, all of us at some level have been there. But here's the beauty. Jesus knows their weakness and he wraps their weakness into his own humanity and he loves them to the end. Even though they abandon him in his hour of greatest need, he will not abandon them. Although they do not intercede for him, he intercedes for them. Although they do not cry with him, he cries for them. Even though they promise to die for him but run off instead, he stays in there and he dies for them. You can see why Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.13 that even if we prove faithless, he proves himself faithful because he cannot deny himself. Faithfulness is wound into the very essence of who God is. He cannot not be faithful to his own. That's the nature of God. That's the nature of Jesus. I kind of love this last point, Jesus' uh, declaration. It's really short, verses 41 and 42. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It's enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. The old Jesus is back. (laughs) Okay. And the old Jesus is ready to walk into the battle even though his disciples will not be with him because he's doing it for them. So let's recap. It's clear as humans we have glaring weakness. I mean, I I don't think I have to uh, emphasize that. We all know it. We all know that when things get tough, we get weak. And even when we try to cover our weakness with strength, we only succeed in exposing our weakness more. And so the, the whole point is just be truthful to God about your weakness. I mean, that's, that's what we don't do. We don't admit our weakness. We don't admit our sin. We don't admit our failure. We're constantly trying to cover it up. And Jesus is inviting us. He, you couldn't put out a broader or brighter red carpet than right here. He invites you to come and express your weakness because look at my disciples. Even though they did all of this to me, I still cared for them. He invites you to come and admit your weakness. And the solution is to know our weakness, to be truthful with God about our weakness. Ed McLaughlin, a medical doctor working in Africa in his book, Promises in the Dark, says it this way. For a long time I thought the statement, my power is made perfect in weakness, that's Paul's line in 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians, meant that God would find a way to work his will through us despite our weaknesses. I thought we could take comfort in our weaknesses from knowing that God would not be hindered by them. If this were true, then I would expect Paul's reply to God's words to be something like, that, something like this. Okay, you can take out the thorn uh, whenever you get there to it, and then things will be even better. You know, Take the thorn away and I'll be even stronger, I'll be even better. But Paul doesn't say that. Paul apparently understood God's point better than I did, McLaughlin says. God said, my power is perfect in weakness. 
It's precisely in our weakness, not in spite of it, that God's power is made perfect. I think that's a good point. It's actually in our weakness that God shows himself most powerful. It's not in spite of it. It's not around it. It's actually in it. So embrace your failure, your inability. Not in the sense that you joy in it. Lord, I'm so grateful I'm a mess. Not that. But that you know God will work powerfully in spite of your weakness. Humble yourself to the weakness. Acknowledge your weakness. Trust Christ's strength in your weakness and, the, and know that God will do his miracle working in your weakness. Number two, <clears throat> even though we are weak, Jesus is strong. And even in Jesus' weakness, Jesus is strong. It's clear that the disciples can't even accomplish the most simple task of helping Jesus. Yet Jesus in his most vulnerable state still helps them. Even in his weakness, it's a strength. And not only does Jesus completely understand our weakness, he understands how hard it is for us. He also knows how to work in our weakness. He knows how to carry us through. He knows how to bring us to that place where we trust him, even when we don't think it's possible. And finally, I hope what you take away from this is that Jesus actually strengthens us to be true friends. True friends. Not the kind of friends that people look in our eyes and say, yeah, they're not going to show up. But the kind of friend where people look in our eyes and we go, you know, this is going to be really hard to show up, but Jesus help me. I need to show up. I, I, I need to show up for my friend. Even though Jesus has every single reason to be completely offended by his disciples. So like, you know, at the end where he says, Peter, are you still sleeping? Peter. Jesus is not offended. You know, there's a lot of reactions Jesus could have had. He could have like thrown himself on the ground and had a temper tantrum. You guys are such losers. Look at what you did. Here I'm in the worst possible time of my life and here you're doing this. He could have, been, he could have done that. Or he could have legitimately give them a lecture here, right? Guys, all right. The 12 of you, 11 now, are going to take over the world, okay? But we can't have this wimpy stuff, okay? We got to have you stronger, okay? We can't have this like falling asleep during prayer time. We need you guys to be on your knees, we need you guys to be known as camel knees. That's James, was known as camel knees. So <clears throat> he could have given them a lecture, but he doesn't. He just says, okay, guys, it's time to get going. Let's go. That's amazing. That's a good friend. And ultimately, Jesus gives them the gift of true friendship, and he lays down his life for his friends, even when they're completely unaware so I want you to think about that this morning as you go. Who needs you to be a friend, really? Who needs you to be the kind of look-in-your-eye friend and know that you'll be their friend for them? And who have you failed in that way? Who do you need to go back and say to them, hey, I'm sorry, I wasn't there for you, but I want to be. So I pray <clears throat> these two things for you today. And number one, you will know that you're weak. I mean, like really weak. Like the catechism says, no moral good could possibly come out of you even when you're trying to do your best. Weak. But I also want you to know, Jesus will never abandon you. Never. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you <clears throat> for your word. Thank you that it's powerful and effective. Thank you that
we can know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you will never abandon us because even in the worst time emotionally and physically of your life you loved your disciples and you loved us to the very end. And more than that, we know, Jesus, that you are now resurrected from the dead. We know that you are sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. We know that you constantly intercess for us in your prayers. And that you are preparing a way in front of us, even in our weakness. For we pray this, Jesus, in your glorious strength, to you be glory forever. Amen.